Welcome, everyone, and um, thank you for coming. My name is Laura Skanga, and I'm the head of creative industries for the Knowledge Transfer Network. Um, I wanted to, again, thank you for joining us because this is our final of the London Fashion Week Talks digital discussions. And I don't know if you've had a chance to been to any, go to any of the others. They've been fantastic. So I, I just am really proud to be here today. And to that end, before the panel introduces themselves, I just wanted to say a big thank you to the British Fashion Council, particularly two ladies who are standing at the back there who need to have a wave. So we've got Sophie <laughs> and Judith. Thank you. Um, now, just so you also are aware that these discussions are really to better understand the fashion industry and what it um, obviously says when it talks about digital and technology. So what we are hoping to do is to write a report summarizing these discussions and we'd like to make it available for everyone. So please do look out for that report um, probably in a month or so. And um, Yes. Lastly, I should say I'd like to make this particular discussion as interactive as possible. So what we'll do is we'll actually have a conversation initially ourselves, and then I'd like to throw it out to the floor and ask the audience for questions. Okay? So um, perhaps let's hear the question read out by Caroline Rush. Hi, I'm Caroline Rush. Welcome to London Fashion Week Talks Digital. It's a new series of talks to explore all elements of digital and innovation. Today's question is, where do we draw the line between commerciality and creativity? Fantastic. So we have set the scene, and um, I'd like the panel now to introduce themselves by telling you a bit about who they are. Remy? Hi. Is this working? Yeah. Um, so my name is Remy. I, um, I have a digital creative agency based in London with a little office in Milan as well, recently open. And um, we do a lot of work for, um, you know, the big fashion brands. Um, and um, so that, I suppose, is the kind of, the more kind of commercial side of our work. Um, but also we um, have, um, we have like a little a project, digital project, which is called Post Matter, which is where we kind of use it as our R&D development. And, um, and we really research creativity on digital platforms and, you know, really explore um, very experimental ways of um, evolving the fashion imagery and, and fashion advertising. Um, so I suppose on a day-to-day -day we've got, you know, within the studio we've got um, both, um, both elements. Fantastic. Rachel. Cool. Hi, uh, my name is Rachel. I am a senior editor at WGSN. If you don't know that, we're a trend forecasting business headquartered out of London. Uh, I'm based in New York where I head up our market intelligence team across the US. So basically covering anything to do with um, business, marketing, and retail, and specializing particularly in all things digital and tech, where I also write for sites like Forbes and Mashable, and have my own um, fashion and tech site called Fashion and Mash. Hi, I'm Sasha Wilkins. I write the blog Liberty London Girl, which I started exactly eight years ago. Um, but I was a fashion editor before that and during it, most recently as fashion and beauty director at the Wall Street Journal's magazine in New York. Um, behind Liberty London Girl, I have my own creative agency. We tell stories for brands using Liberty London Girl as a platform. And I'm also a cookbook writer. My book comes out in 10 days' time, if anyone <laughs> feels the need to buy a great new cookbook. Uh, hi, oh, mine's well louder than yours. <laughs> <coughs> or maybe my voice is. Hi, uh, I'm Henry Holland. Uh, I'm a designer. I've got a label called House of Holland. Uh, we've been going for um, eight years or so. Um, and I produce four women's wear collections a year. Oh, sorry. Um, and um, yeah, that's me. Sorry. Hi, I'm Daniela Cecilio, and then I'm the founder of ASAP54. Uh, which is launched pretty much six months ago. And ASAP, it's kind of a new way to search and discover fashion. So it allows you to take a picture of anything that you see, and then we find you something similar for you to shop online. So the idea is to make the whole world shoppable and make the search for fashion easier and more, and, and then more kind of emotional as well. 
Fantastic. And as you can tell from this particular panel, everyone here is a cross between both the creative and the commercial spheres. They're, they're working in it. And um, what I wanted to do was tie together some of the themes that have run throughout the other two talks, particularly around the notion of commerciality. And, um, but I wanted to explore something specific because there's been a lot of talk about tech and, and gadgets. And the, one of the, the uh, interesting things is that we as consumers and business people tend to sometimes get lost or get excited by the latest shiny new toy. Um, and, and I guess you can see that because digital has brought us these things called apps, which is great and everybody you know, has to have one. And um, then it also has now brought us this thing called social media. Okay, great. We all need to be on it as well. But what is the value? You know, what is the value in terms of how does that translate to, to revenue? And particularly, how do you make that latest creative thing into something that is viable in the fashion world? Now, Sasha, I'm kind of pointing at you first. Great. And the reason why I'm doing that is because of you, you do, having done this now for eight years and making a success out of the ability to write and, and, and blogging initially. What are your thoughts? There's always a conversation around blogging between creativity and consumerism because blogging is supposed to be the independent voice. We're supposed to be the people who don't have advertisers. We talk about what we like, what we don't like, and we use our personal taste levels to talk about what we're doing, which is in the very pure sense what an editor does, but we are supposed to be unalloyed by those commercial considerations. But of course, as blogging has continued, Bloggers decide they want, they get lots of traffic. They think this could be my business. It's a lot more exciting mm -hmm. um, than maybe people's day jobs. I myself wanted the freedom to write without an editor telling me what to do. But you obviously need money. I need to pay the bill. I have a very expensive sausage dog. Um, and I had to find a way to make money without alienating my readers. Mm -hmm. And it is very difficult. But I always think that integrity is a very overused word in the fashion industry, as is authenticity but they are the two pillars of what you have to do, which is to find what the voice of your brand is and always stay true to that. So regardless of whom I'm working for, and it's the power of no, we turn down about 80, 85% of what we're asked to do, we create our own content, which is probably why it says I'm a creative director up there, because we don't run anyone else's content, we create content for brands, so it feels like my opinion and my views aligned with someone else's brand. That's, and that's, you know, a point that I want to pick up again in another question, which is around what we think of as success in a way. But um, before we, I'm going to park that one because I want to come back to it. And so yourself, Daniela, this is something that you have combined. You've combined both the notion of an application and also social media. So what, what do you see going forward? How, how, how do you see that becoming of, of value, whether it's to the consumers or even to yourself as a business? I think the, I mean, my idea behind uh, ASAP 54 was a frustration that I was facing because the information is available in every f form and shape, device and so on. So you have magazines, you have blogs, but not everything is shoppable. So there was no one doing the link of making whatever is available on Instagram, Pinterest, fashion blogs, magazine, to be able to shop straight away. So. The word was available, the information was there, nothing was shoppable. So my idea behind that was a frustration as a consumer as well, to be able to find something to shop uh, right now on the spot. Um, and then what I, I mean, my view behind is also to change and to make this search more uh, emotional, just translate the emotion that you have towards your fashion into the search as well. Because the tools that you have available right now, the very like the Google, they're not very fashion focused, so there's no accuration behind. So the idea here is make fashion, make so, um, search very easy. Uh, you can translate the emotions via images as well, but then you also have kind of the creation element behind. That's, that's actually quite a good point to take it to because it sort of leads us into a bit about creativity. But before we get into the next question, did either the three of you wanted to comment on that? I mean, Remy, part of what it is that you're doing, again, is that blend between creativity and commerciality, but particularly around how do you make what you're working on very, very commercial. I don't know if you wanted to kind of add to it. I mean, it's funny, for, for many years when I, when I well, since I've been doing my, um, 
my, my work, um, my personal work on post matter, uh, which I said earlier is kind of like our, the R&D uh, department of our, our magazine, we, we almost kind of like didn't, didn't mind not, uh, it not being commercial at all. Like we kept it very kind of protected, almost like an, you know, really like a very pure art piece. Um, but um, having learned from that and having done that and, and, and therefore kind of personally having paid for it through, through all those years, I kind of realize now that it was, it was a nice um, intention to keep it very pure and to keep it, um, you know, away from all, all, all kind of forms of sponsorship and advertising. But really, I think I've learned from, from, from the experience and it is really important to put your work out there especially when it's you know creative work like this for it to get for it to get judged for it to get um assessed and for it to get um, um you know praised or or maybe kind of um, um you know or the contrary well actually one of the interesting things is that with remy you're working on the business to business sort of relationship and daniela you're really much about the business to consumer henry that's obviously where you're at is the business to consumer Actually, both probably, <laughs> um, and I guess you know, you know, in terms of what it is that you're doing, you're both the creative and the commercial face of your organisation. Um, I think as my the way that my business started was kind of almost in reverse to a lot of other designers. I mean, I started with uh, a line of T-shirts, um, which is kind of the most commercial element of fashion. You know, it's. It's kind of what normally where a designer brand gets to after three or four years, after showcasing their creativity, they then manage to refine that into something commercial, you know, in terms of something like a T-shirt. So I started kind of back to front in that way. Um, so I always had a very commercial slant to my work because I always had bills to pay and I, you know, I gave up a career to, to change careers. I was a journalist at teen magazines. And um, so it was kind of... I've always had a very commercial focus to what I do. Um, and yes, like you say, we worked with the business to business and also business to consumer. Um, and whilst what I do is very creative and every day is about creating new things and realizing ideas, at the end of the day, those ideas need to be desirable um, and they need to be covetable by a consumer um, for my business to even exist. And, and actually, that's a really good point. And again, tying some of the themes in from previous discussions, we've had a lot of conversation around the who, you know, who do you actually create for? And that makes perfect sense because everybody has to have a customer. And then we also talked about the how, you know, the how that you, how you're actually creating something. And that was the first discussion, you know, um, was very much about the how. But what about the what? What you're actually building and the product and services that you're actually creating and the kind of relationship that that has with the consumer. And I think, Rachel, you probably have seen, especially in the fashion world, a lot of the fashion and the tech trends. And I don't know if you wanted to comment on that in terms of the what, what's being created, what's being produced. Yeah, well, I mean, I think maybe to speak to Sasha's point at the beginning, you know, it's a very overused word, as you said, but authenticity is definitely one that um, that we're, you know, really concentrating on. And I think when we're, we're not seeing a great deal of that um, across the board when it comes to technology. And, you know, there's, there's two different angles to it. There's technology in terms of what is innovative and it's brand building. And then there's technology that is the same thing, but it's not necessarily brand building in an authentic way. It's much more of a, a stunt or a gimmick. And, you know, if you look at this fashion week particularly, and, and I'm talking actually much more about New York than London, the big trend there from a technology perspective, which I'm sure most of you have seen, was wearables. You know, every single brand, um, not every single brand, lots of brands launched a wearable of some description. And, um, you know, there's a big argument there. Is that authentically something that ties to the brand? Do they need to release this gadget that's a, a wrist wearable that enables you to see when somebody's sending you a text message? Or is it just a brand partnership that gets them right in the limelight at this point of time when technology is that buzzword that journalists like myself and others will cover? And I do obviously still cover it, so. And actually, you know, because this is a really good point, I don't know if 
this is a time to ask anybody in the audience if you have a burning question about this particular subject area, because we've just gone through the points around, you know, sort of skirted around the, the notion of creativity, but mostly looking at commercials. But if you had a question, then we do have a microphone, so if you want to raise your hand at any points, please do, and then I'll come back to you, okay? Um, we do have a mic, right? Yeah, okay. Um, but, but actually, you know, the, the, the whole, again, going back to the point about the, the gadgets, and we, we've seen a bit of that. And, you know, Henry, you're kind of making and creating, and you've got to go back to the office and make something else. <laughs> you know? But what, what are you thinking about in terms of the, the, the latest fads in terms of gadgets? Yes, you know, an app that can send you something. Do, does it, does it, is it of interest to you yet? Or, do you want it to be of interest? Do you even care? I mean... Yeah, it's very much of interest, and it's about trying to find a new and interesting way to utilise that and incorporate it into my, to my company, into my brand, in a way that is exciting for my customer, rather than, you know, it's the authenticity thing again, rather than just, like, making, um, you know, a rubber bracelet that tells me when I fell asleep and when I woke up. Um, but I think... It's beautiful. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I think it's, it's, it's a very topical conversation. It's the, it, you know, there's so much talk about fashion and tech and wearable tech and, and how we can utilise that. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a very interesting and it's a new development, it's a new area of the industry that people are exploring a lot. And I think it's, it's important to try and stay ahead of the curve and try and utilise this new technology in a way that is authentic to your brand. Um, and, and it's, all, it's all changing so quickly and it's all developing, so it's about finding the right way of using it, I think. I remember going to the Bartlett, which is the MA School of um, Architecture School in London, uh, 10 years ago, and one of the final year projects at the Bartlett was on wearable technology. And I remember thinking, well, it's interesting, but how on earth are we going to use that? But of course, we didn't have social media, we didn't have digital media. But the point remains, people have been talking about wearable technology for really quite a long time. And we still don't really have anything that's enormously viable, apart from the very ugly looking Apple Watch. So I think we're getting very excited about something that still is in such infancy. Which is Rachel's true. Rachel's nodding away. No, I completely agree with you. I think it is massively in infancy, which is exactly why you see all of this innovation work that's, you know, is essentially brand partnerships. It's, you know, if you compare it even to a year ago, we are, you know, a, a massive leap forward with where all of that is because we have had these brand partnerships. So I'm not saying that that's a bad thing by any means. I mean, certainly it's, it's definitely a step in the right direction. But I think even with Apple, you know, this is the first version. It's super early days. And, you know, the, where we'll see it go will be very exciting, but it's not necessarily there just now and I think maybe my point is that it, it shouldn't be for every single brand and it has to it has to tie to something fundamentally that works. And you know this isn't actually just about wearables, this is the same with what we've seen with social media and innovation and you know someone like Burberry obviously completely led that charge over the last few years and you know has as a result really been put on this pedestal as a pioneer for digital and that's something that really appeals to every other brand to try and achieve is something along those same lines. So something such as wearables comes along and it's a new opportunity to be associated with innovation and with creativity because that does grab attention both from a press perspective but from a consumer perspective too. If you look at how well Burberry has done off of the back of being innovative in a new space that's therefore led it forward and you know transformed it as a result. And I, and I actually I'm, I'm going to shift slightly away from the wearables conversation because Remy, I wanted to jump in here from the client perspective. You're actually using digital and technology in a fashion world to convey something else or convey the product, again, what it is and how to sell it, basically. That's what you do, um, which is different to what Henry does. You know, you're kind of helping the likes of Henry to kind of deliver. So what's your, what's your take on some of this in terms of the, again, the gadgetry and the shiny new toys? Obviously, there's a huge sense of application for mm -hmm. on the business to business front, but. I mean, it, 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 to kind of like reverse the question a little bit, definitely like a lot of the brands, the, you know, they, they kind of come to us with, um, you know, they, they want to, it's completely the commercial side of things. They ask us to come up with creative solutions in order to, um, in a way, kind of, um, to kind of hide this kind of, uh, you know, commercial, um, intent um, but um, 
I think going back to the whole, you know, wearable, because I, I, I did have a little something to say on that. At least with, you know, all this kind of gadgetry that's being put for the right or for the wrong reasons into the hands of, like, each and every one of us, um, it's at least those devices, they are, you know, we are starting to kind of wear them and we're starting to kind of start to live with them. And I think coming from that, a lot of, like, creativity is going to be able to um, stem from this, um, from this, you know, us being kind of wired uh, from, from head to toe soon. Um, but they are obviously, you know, within this, a couple of people that are going to flip the way that, you know, you're supposed to kind of, and, and this device is intended to kind of be used for, and then um, really use it in a, in a very innovative way, and in use it in a, a you know, really kind of pure, um, fun, creative, artistic way. Which is true, which mm. is very true. I don't think anybody's going to deny that because I think, Daniela, even the application that you've created, again, it's trying to make use and make sense of what you have already available to you. And it's going to evolve into something else. So I, I, I don't know if you had it, uh, wanted to add a comment on there as well. I think it's more for us as on, on the Google Glasses. This is something we're looking at because I think it makes a lot of sense if you're walking around with a pair of glasses to see, to actually be able to see what is available to be shot or record somehow. So I think it's also, I mean, we're looking into the new, the, you know, the watch or Google Glasses, and, but the apps that are available out there will have to be changed. It's not about receiving emails on your watch, but will be more about something else. I don't know, reminders of meetings that you have. So there will be a, you know, there will be lots of kind of new technologies and new apps coming, or existing apps that will be adjusting to the new technology. In our case, for wearables, we, ha we don't have a strategy yet, but we're already looking into Google Glasses, because I think it's a good fit for what we, we do. Like, you're walking around, you get inspired by people or by anything around you, by the landscape. And it would be amazing if you could shop something that would you know, be similar to that. So we're trying to see how to do that. So say it again. So explain that. So you're wearing the Google Glass and... And you're walking around and you're seeing everything around you. You can yeah. kind of probably, my idea with that, we're exploring it. Yeah. It's very far ahead on our, on our roadmap. But you can kind of record or see or just mm -hmm. find a way to link that to a shopping item. Because the entry point in my app can be anything. It can be a landscape, can be food. And then you can translate that. There's a gamification site where you can translate food into dresses. Or you can translate uh, a landscape into skirts. So that would be kind of the way of to use that as well and apply our technology. And actually, um, I have a kind of a question that, um, again, was around um, something that was raised earlier. And it was really about the fact that with analytics, we, we, can all ent we all know what our customers are wanting from us because of what they're saying, and we're tracking what customers are saying. So we're all sitting there saying, ah, oh, you know, we know what our customers want, give them what they want. But in old marketing terms, there's this thing called anticipating what your customers want. And so, and again, you know, this exploration, and Remy, this is what you're also probably alluding to, is that you're getting to the point of, we want to actually go a bit farther than just delivering what they want today, because actually, if you explore, you might discover something that is a little more exciting. So your description, Daniela, of the Google Glass walking around and connecting it to shop sounds like, OK, really? You know, but actually, if you try it, you never know. You never know whether or not that might stick. It might become the next big thing. Um, but Remy, I just kind of wanted to come back to you again, because this was, I think, a point that you were trying to make as well. Mm -hmm. Sorry, in no, 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 just in terms of whether or not the relationship of getting ahead of what your customers want and delivering more than what they, more than what they want. And, and it, if that's something that you do in terms of translating it to your customers, maybe it's not couching it, you know, couching the commercial stuff, but, but actually helping your clients identify, well, what is it that they're trying to do and how is it that they're anticipating what their customers are asking no, for? For sure, for sure, and, you know, also, um, you know, we've, we've noticed that, you know, when you're communicating to, um, at least with some of my clients, when you're communicating to social, uh, through social media and, you know, just generally through digital platforms, you're actually reaching um, probably a, a, a tier of their, um, you know, um, of their customers, which, you know, at the moment don't really have the kind of buying power, um, but it's definitely an audience that is going to have it soon. 
Um, and it's definitely an audience that you wouldn't be able to reach on, um, you know, classic magazines. Like those, those people, you know, uh, I see everyone in the audience, you all look quite young. I don't know how often, you know, you guys buy like a printed issue of Vogue or, or Harper's or something. But clearly you're all connected 24-7 on, you know, the, the social media channels of, of, of those um, brands or, or, or published publications. Um, so, yeah, there is a certain amount of, it, it, it's kind of planting the seeds um, for, um, uh, to kind of create brand kind of advocates and um, and and almost kind of making people aware of the brand before they they are aware of the brand well before you know well I actually no you're absolutely right and I think this is kind of going back and again it's slightly circular comment but the you know going back to the the wearables because if this is a, a at the at the moment I mean you've got Sasha has an example of of a wearable on her arm but if we're going to use it and we're going to expand any further, then there might be more applications, more desire. Um, and at the moment, it sounds like a bit gimmicky, but there might be something happening in, in the future. And Rachel, I think you were trying to say that as well. <clears throat> and I don't know if you wanted to elaborate on that anymore. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, and I think, it, as I said, it's not just with wearables, right? We've seen this big trend for, as we've kind of referred to it, tech for tech's sake. So this is big gimmicky moves, particularly around Fashion Week. I mean, I'll give you a very classic example from last season, drones on the Fendi catwalk. I mean, brilliant in many, many ways, hugely headline grabbing. Everybody wrote about it. In terms of timing, couldn't have been better. Amazon had obviously just announced that they too were looking at drones. Does it do anything for the Fendi brand from a consumer angle in terms of actually selling that collection? Probably not. But does it make everybody in this room start talking about Fendi? Yes. So it's really clever. You know, suddenly we're sort of associating Fendi with that idea of innovation. I can't remember what that collection was. I can't remember anything about those clothes. I don't know if anyone else can, but I can remember the, the drones. So, you know, an another example of, of doing it quite well. And then if you go to the other end of the scale, you know, you have the more the retail level. And there we're seeing a lot of innovation happening. But again, often it really is for press purposes. There's the new H&M store in Times Square in New York, and this one was really interesting. It launched as its most tech-enabled store ever. It has an entire mezzanine level that has a, a runway. You can go into the changing room, put your clothes on, you, you know, try, try on the new clothes, go on out onto the catwalk, and you know, do your walk, have your photo taken, have the video recorded, go and put your details into the little screen afterwards, and it will beam out to Times Square on all of the billboards around it. Now... <laughs> It, there's a lot of people that want to do that, <laughs> apparently. So, exactly. Well, so the interesting thing about it was that this launched, again, tons of coverage all over the press. I went in there about a week later. Nothing was working. The catwalk wasn't working. Every screen had an error on it, and the billboards outside were just playing the same people on repeat. They, I mean, they must have been loving it, but... Um, <laughs> The point, again, is that, you know, with all of this technology stuff, it's all very well at this kind of high innovation with this incredibly tech-enabled brand. But if it doesn't then work down the line, and in this instance, it was as simple as the fact that the training hadn't fully been given to the sales staff. I mean, when I spoke to some of the sales associates, they, they actually couldn't answer the question as to why it wasn't working, other than the fact that it was down for maintenance. Well, I went back several times, and it was quite often down for maintenance. So it's that same thing. It's, you know, I mean, and it's a very different story for retail. You can launch it in a flagship store, but if you've got hundreds of stores around the country, putting that out at scale is a really difficult thing. So, you know, tech is... It works in an innovation sense, but actually working in terms of hitting your customer that's going to be buying, we're not there yet. No. And... Yeah, we do have a question. Sorry, yes. Um, so, so just on the wearables point, it feels like brand-driven wearables, to exactly your point, is driven by the media guys and not the product guys. It's the media guys who are chasing the earned media. My issue comes from, it just feels like the education piece isn't there. It felt yesterday with the panel with Instagram and Facebook, she wasn't doing the education piece and she was allowing both the agencies and the client to act dumb about what their platform can actually do. And it feels like um, agencies with respect to, to what, the fun, what fabulous work you're doing at Mary, it feels like agencies are upselling innovation to some degree. Um, because they just don't understand how to drive commerce through the platforms. And I worry that without the understanding from the, the global partners or the, or the global platforms, 
uh, the education from them, the education from the agency, we're going to constantly have dumb clients who are going to be chasing these these uh, earned media, um, no, sorry, these uh, earned media uh, plays. Um, and also to Henry, I mean, you started in MySpace. How has everything changed since then? <laughs> Good question. A lot. Yeah, it makes me feel old even mentioning MySpace now. Um, but yeah, the first thing I ever did was uh, copy and paste a PayPal link onto my MySpace page, and that was the only way I had of selling my T-shirts. Um, and, you know, that just Social meant commerce. that we've always... Sorry? Social commerce. Yes. I didn't even have a name then, I don't think. Um, <laughs> And so, like, that just meant that we've always had an e-commerce kind of, like, art, like, part of the business. It's always been something that we've worked with and trying to work on making it more interesting and more exciting to our customers. And we've done loads of things wrong over the years and made websites in Flash and all those kind of things that cost me loads of money. Um, <laughs> and I think what we've just launched this fashion week, we've actually partnered with a company called Metail where... Uh, you were able to try on the clothes on a sort of fully fitted form with your measurements uh, with the pieces that walked the runway as they went out on the runway through our website. So, again, that's just a, a way of us marrying up with tech and trying to utilise that in a way that's interesting for our customer. It's, it's enhancing their experience on our website and eventually trying to drive them to make purchase. Sasha, you look I mean, like you want to... I mean, this season at London Fashion Week, Henry, Burberry, Topshop are probably the three brands that owned the idea of in integrating tech innovation into what they were doing. And, you know, going to the idea between where do you draw the line between creativity and commerciality because a runway show is supposed to be about creativity in its purest sense of the word. So you go to a show like Topshop where you could argue they aren't really show clothes that belong on a runway. It's going to be controversial, but, I mean, they're not really, are they? Um, and yet that show was based all around taking it out to the consumer. It's almost irrelevant there were any fashion editors in the room. It was a show that was there to design to be shared on social media, and they paired up, I think, with five or six Instagrammers whose images were then being shown in the windows of Oxford Circus. And I went to have a look, because I knew I was sitting on this panel, and I wanted to see how people interacting. It was a shit show around Oxford Circus. There were so many people standing outside Topshop, massively engaging with, in what was going on in the windows as a direct result of their London Fashion Week activity. So Topshop have managed to marry their creativity and commerciality very well. You're except expecting that. Ex Sorry? But we're expecting that to translate into some decent revenue, right? Well, it's interesting that they've lowered what I think is the age range that people are going to buy that collection because in previous seasons of Topshop, Unique Show has clearly been aimed at a quite paired back 30-something shopper. This show with Cara Delevingne opening and the final exit as well. It was a very, very young collection. I think the price point will probably drop for it. And I think they're really working out that's who their customer is, that kind of tech-enabled stuff. When they showed in Manchester Square two seasons ago, and you could, shop, you could get people shopping the catwalk, but I was thinking there's a huge disconnect between the clothes that were on the runway, which appealed very much to me, couldn't see them appealing to people who are going to be using that technology to shop from it. Oops. I, I'm sure it's, nothing has fallen apart. Can I add something on to that as well? I think, um, I mean, in the case of H&M, just to take an example, uh, technology needs to be on the DNA of the company as well. It needs to be the core of what you're doing. Your case was pretty much your first step to sell. Burberry has always been ahead of technology. If you're a pure retailer, they, you know, you understand about the production, selling, you have a great shop floor experience, but technology is not the core of what you do. You can come up with the best and most innovative idea but you won't be able to execute because it won't be your priority on a daily basis. Mm. So you have to identify as a brand where your DNA is and then be kind of use technology only if you're able to keep up with the pace because technology and social media opens up to the world. Then you create a massive campaign on social media and you have no website or your website has five products to be sold. So there has to be a connection from top to the bottom. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Yeah, and it's very interesting. And to go back to the core of your um, interesting comment, I mean, I think so far the kind of technology, you know, innovation, I don't know if you can still call it innovation, but that has actual, you know, a weight and return on investment for a, a brand. I think it's just simply e-commerce. So that, um, that obviously is something that now all the brands have to do. But I think the kind of culprit is not only the agencies to kind of try and sell everything and anything technology to brands, um, because, I guess, yeah, they, a lot of them do that to a certain extent. Um, 
But I think really the, the, the main kind of um, person to point a finger at is the tech industry for kind of innovating at such a kind of frenetic pace where, you know, literally, um, you know, they, they'll come up with something new every, every couple of weeks. And they then put the fear in all the other industries, not just fashion, like, you know, every other industry of like, what are you guys going to do about, what are you guys going to do about this new innovation? And, you know, they, it, that, kind of, that kind of scares the other, the other industries into having to jump on board this new innovation without completely agree, without completely understanding, well, a total really sometimes understanding what it's going to bring to their, their kind of the, the core DNA of the brand. But they just feel that they need to be, they just feel that they need to be there. I think um, fear has been a topic quite a few times this in the last few days, um, you know, and one of the one of the sort of directions from that is really, well, <clears throat> businesses perhaps need to stop not necessarily following the trends or using the terminology, for instance, wearables, and this came up, I think it was yesterday, um, but actually realize that it's just part of the business. And I think, Daniela, you're trying to say this. It's kind of like, it's just part of business. You just need to identify what it is. Don't be frightened by it because it can actually help your sales process. So if social media is part of your marketing tools, great, you know, use it, but don't, don't be frightened by it. Don't feel like you have to actually jump in when you're not necessarily ready. And I guess there is a lot of perhaps that going on and, and people falling foul on their face. And perhaps that's what you were experiencing with your catwalk in um, Times Square that didn't actually work. Wait, I, think, I think my point with this is actually you know, you just, you just said if social is part of your marketing mix, great. Well, that makes it sound like social actually is still this separate entity that should be considered as innovation. And actually, social should, should be in your marketing mix now as absolutely standard. And I think what, what I'm particularly excited about at the moment is seeing the brands that are taking something like that putting aside that innovation piece and actually just doing a really brilliant job across all their channels to really hit their consumers. And I'll give you two brilliant examples. One, Michael Kors, absolutely killing it on every single social platform. The great thing about that brand is you see a photo on Instagram, you don't even need to look at the caption or the person that's posted it to know it's a Michael Kors image. It's so visually strong in terms of being on brand. And the other example, uh, most of you probably won't know, there's a great brand in the US called Chubby's. This is a short shorts brand for men. And um, what they do brilliantly is they just have a very on-brand message across every channel in terms of being very funny. They have this tagline called Skies Out, Thighs Out. It's fantastic. And they, this is for men. This is for very men. Short, short, very short shorts, short. yeah, for men. And um, it's, it's kind of for that, you know, bro, American bro, you know out on the beach getting drunk, that kind of scenario. But it's brilliant. Every single channel, I urge all of you to go on their website, take a look at it, sign up to their emails because they will make you laugh every single day. So and you know what? Again? They're selling so many shorts because of it. What's it called again? Chubbies. 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 You heard it here. Chubbies. And isn't that the thing that you don't need to draw a line between creativity and commerciality if you get your brand tone of voice right? If you go back to what I said right at the beginning, to an authenticity and integrity, if you get it right, there doesn't need to be a line because the two things should be interacted. Because if you're creative without sales, you're buggered. Anybody else want to ask another question? I don't know if there was one, because I only just looked up at one point. Ah, right here. So this lady here. Um, I was just wondering what you think um, will happen to brands who haven't embraced technology as much and who maybe haven't got a very good social media presence or even an e-commerce platform. Well, <laughs> I think it depends on the brand. I think it depends massively on the brand. And if it's not right for your brand and it doesn't fit in with your customer base, then you shouldn't try and do. You shouldn't try and make yourself fit into it. You know, I think there's so many brands out there. Not that many anymore, but there was brands that were quite late to pick up on social media, and I think that was right for them. And I think it made sense to certain brands and other brands with a different customer base and a different sort of demographic. Then they had to jump on board much earlier. Celine's a good example. They don't really use social media, do yeah. they? Um, they don't, it's not what their brand's about. But Tom Ford's interesting because when he first started showing, it was in closed salon shows, no smart devices. Last season, he invited about six of us British bloggers to his show. We were like, why are we getting Tom Ford invitations? He hates us. Um, and so it depends on the evolution of your brand. He's now decided to, to yeah. you know, open up big, big shows, have people talking about it. I think it just depends on where you are and the growth mm. of your brand. There's, I mean, I think both uh, are interesting comments, but there's definitely, as we 
as, as the kind of years pass, going to be a, um, a visibility issue for the brands that decide not to take that on board. And you know, Celine is obviously a good example, and, and, and I was about to mention it as well, where, again, like not everyone reads Vogue here or definitely buys the print issue. So you know, where, where do brands communicate if they don't communicate on social media or on digital? Well, they're you know? expecting their customer to communicate on social, aren't they? That's how Celine works, really, isn't on it? On behalf of the brand. Yeah. yeah. True. They, but then it's an uncontrolled way. Yeah, but they've also stopped people posting pictures on, on Instagram during the shows, so they don't allow people to bring their phones to the shows anymore. So, because the high street was copying the looks just the day after the show. But you know, Phoebe Filo at the Vogue Festival this year says that she, well, obviously she's speaking in a public environment, but she said, I take it as a huge compliment when I see companies copying my clothes. I know they can never be as good as mine, so it doesn't really matter. But is this, sorry, before you jump in, I just wanted to ask the question around exclusivity, because there's a point at which actually making it closed shop actually create some hype around it in its own right? It's kind of like doing the reverse. I don't know, I mean, I'm just, I'm just wondering. I mean, that's kind of exactly what I was gonna say. I mean, obviously Tom Ford live streamed for the first time last night, but when he, when he first had that closed salon, it worked because it was Tom Ford. And again, it was a press stunt in many ways that got so much coverage because he wasn't allowing people in. That works if we're big brands and that's all we've talked about here. We haven't really talked about emerging designers. I would argue that now if you're an emerging designer, it is impossible to not have some kind of digital presence and expect to succeed. They just, they don't go to hand in hand. And my other point to your question was that a lot of these big brands are doing a lot of digital work but it's not the digital work that the consumer sees. So you take someone like a Chanel, they have an enormous digital team, and it's all behind the scenes. You take someone like Louis Vuitton, a lot of it is to, you know, it's all about search, it's all about, um, you know, making sure that you come out top rather than all those counterfeit goods, that kind of thing. And, you know, actually Chanel has an incredible YouTube. They might not have an Instagram page, even though their Instagram account exists with no posts on it, it has 1.9 million followers, also interesting. But they have an incredible YouTube. And also, you know, for these brands, Burberry, another example, you look at Burberry's innovation work over the last year or two, absolutely all of it is tied to beauty and fragrance, all of it. So they're starting to realize that that millennial digital that they first launched with and wasn't able to afford to buy a trench, they needed to refocus something. So they brought in all their, they brought all their licensing back in house, now selling fragrance, selling, you know, nail polish live off the catwalk yesterday, that kind of a thing, because the person that they are reaching over digital can afford to buy that product. And the one thing is, what they have to understand is the consumer will find a way to get one way or another. So Chanel, for instance, so they create this, like a supermarket, and then which is very kind of affordable and available. Then the products can only be found in store, and then if you're lucky, you go to the wish list and then wait for it to come. So then the product, it's not available. Okay, I understand the strategy behind. What I don't understand is the consumer will buy, the consumer in China will find a parallel way to get hold of the product. So if one way or another, they have no way to control the distribution channel completely because, do you know what I mean? There are so many other ways. Like in China, they have Taobao, they have so many tools that they actually send people from Paris to the stores and the people will buy and just send back. So it's, it's not going to the consumer they're expecting. It's getting, you know, it's reaching everyone. And that's the only concern I have. Also, I love Celine, I'm a big fan of the brand, but the availability, even in the stores, the, the way they merchandise the store is so hard. So sometimes you have to go all the way to Miami to find a pair of shoes that is not available in any other of the stores. So it just makes hard for the consumers that have no time as well. I wanted to be, I wanted to add those kind of exclusive uh, brands. So it's, I guess, a way of doing exclusivity the wrong way, as opposed to kind of the right way. Which kind of leads me to another question. Before I ask my question, aha, we have another question up here. Bye. No, 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 there's a, there's a microphone coming. Thank you. This is mainly to Henry and, well, actually the whole panel. How do you see the speed of fast fashion and all the social media is killing almost to an extent the level of creativity and commerciality? Because you're having to put out so much on so many different platforms as well as the collections. You know, it seems to be going a million miles an hour and part of that's coming from obviously the tech world and I just wanted to have you guys' opinion on it. Um, yeah, I think it's just another way of being creative. It's about being creative with your time. It's about being creative with your budget. So it's about creating enough collections for your consumer and creating exciting stories and things for them to interact with. Um, but yeah, it is going a lot faster. And I think 
the, the, main, uh, the main change in pace is the way that the consumer is receiving the information. So, you know, before social, I think it was very much the catwalks were then edited down by the editors, which was then translated through to the consumer a couple of months later in a, in a monthly issue, and then it would hit stores bang on time three months later when the issues were out and you could buy everything. But now the consumer can see the images from the catwalk the minute that they, they go out there and they want it there and then. And I think that's the disconnect. I think it's the time between the shows and the time between the products hitting stores that is, is getting the consumer so sort of riled up and like the, the pace, the real change of pace that I can see, I think. And, and I, think, um, I think it's about two industries that were always very close, like really finally coming together. And that is the, uh, you know, the fashion, uh, the, the, the retail industry and the publishing industry, where the pace is fast, but it's not, it's not scary. You know, they, they've been, you know, daily newspapers coming out every day for the last kind of um, thousand years. And so it, it is, I think it is about brands and retailers having to shift um, their, their core business to also become publishers of content um, so that they can um, satisfy this urge of, of you know, feeding content to, 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 all, the, to all the followers. And um, uh, yeah. Actually, yesterday, somebody made the comment that uh, editorial increases sales by 15 to 20%. So that was a huge piece of information. I don't know if anybody needed to know that, but that was uh, rather interesting. And I don't know, Rachel, but then what do they class as editorial anymore? Because is editorial yeah, social, is editorial yeah. print magazine, you know, what is it? It's this big content thing yeah. that yeah. no one really has I mean, defined. The, the obvious thing there is you look at the huge migration of very talented traditional editorial staff who are all moving over to uh, online commerce, matches, net a porte have just been scooping everybody up. I understand. Um, uh, Jessica Diner from v British Vogue is going over to Birchbox to be their creative director on the beauty side. Um, and it interests me that the Holy Grail was always, as a journalist or an editor, you wanted to work in magazines and you didn't really mind that you got paid tuppence halfpenny in a new pair of shoes. And now everyone's like, great, brave new world of digital and money, and they're all running like lemmings towards it. Well, there you go. It's fantastic. It's a resurgence of people who can actually write. Um, Oh, well, we've got a couple of questions here. And um, how important do you feel the role is for fashion bloggers in this day and age? Extremely important. <laughs> <laughs> no, that they, was a short I mean, answer. The, no, and I completely second that. And they, you know, they are the new editors. You know, like um, you know, someone, someone like um, Sasha is, you know, honestly. Um, um, with with the following that she has, like you know, she 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 you know she could be more important than you know the editor of um, French Vogue or like a big you know, and no no but like really like purely in terms of like eyeballs, like they are so much more relevant than those kind of antiquated um, editors. Um, so yeah, I mean, super important. They are the uh, they are the 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 people that set the um, you the know tone? the tone. Well, I'm going to just. Uh be a little bit of a devil. And uh, Rachel, because you see, you know, you see sort of again the, the, the trends. Is that, is that accurate? Is that, cur you know, do you, do you agree no, with no, that? No, I do. I mean, I do agree. I mean, I think certainly influencer marketing, whether it's with a blogger, whether it's with a model, whether it's with a celebrity, that still 100% is relevant for a brand and it helps to shift product. Um, you know, and it might be a, a particularly commercial relationship with a blogger of some description, or it might be that it happens much more organically than that, but it certainly works. And I think the trend that we're really seeing is this, is this shift towards um, much more accessibility for a consumer. So obviously, with a blogger, they feel that they're much more, you know, it's much more in line with their way of life than may maybe the editor of French Vogue would be. And likewise, you know, that's why we see someone like Cara Delevingne doing so well. Um, purely because of the fact that she seems like she's a very accessible person. She has a personality. She's not just a person walking down the catwalk. And so, you know, for, for a brand to associate themselves with that, it works wonders for them, not, you know, obviously helped by the fact that she has so many millions of followers. And there was another comment, uh, another question here, yes. Hi, it's Sam Alderton from WGS, and finally. Um, my question is probably directed at Henry, but I think everyone can probably answer this. Um, new research has sort of come out to say that the early adopter effect is very much a thing, and 
people should really be adopting new social media platforms early on in order to grow their audiences really um, effectively. Except this really isn't the case for big brands like Chanel. They already have 1.7 million followers on Instagram and they've got no posts and they follow no one. So my question is, how should young brands, emerging designers, be adopting um, these social media platforms early on? I think just in whatever way comes naturally. I think with emerging designers, they're usually um, you know, started up by younger people who actually already interact and engage with these social platforms on an everyday basis. It's the way that they communicate with their friends. It's the way that they share their own personal information. So it's much more, um, it's much easier for them to then translate that into a business sense because they're just sharing the same kind of information that they would anyway on their own personal platforms, but from from a different account. I think it, it often works much more authentically than having a board meeting and sitting 15 people around being like, right, Instagram, how should we do this? You know, I think it's much more that they just start to share the stuff that they feel comfortable with sharing. To keep it organic, right? So? To keep it really organic and authentic. Yeah, like just keep it organic. Saying. And it, yeah, I think, I, I personally feel like it's when things work, when people believe them and they're authentic. Whereas if you have a sort of a long-winded strategy and you try to stick to that, I think on certain social platforms, I think the consumer sees right through that. And I think there's only a certain way that you can market to your consumers through social platforms and the rest of it is just more about creating your world. I, Henry and I were both at the BFC's Digital Pillar event at Google Campus two weeks ago, which had over 70 attendees from London Fashion Week designers and the people behind the brands there. And talking to a lot of the designers at that event, they had mentoring stations from Instagram and Facebook and retailers like Net-A-Porter and ASOS, all sitting there to give free advice. It was confusion. I think a lot of the designers don't, younger designers don't understand which platforms they should be using. And I think it is a real issue at the moment. But I thought that day was incredibly helpful just to help people really focus. You know, you don't need to be on Vine. And, you know, make sure you own your name so no one can nick it. That's clearly why Chanel have got their Instagram channel. But you don't need to be sitting on every single platform. Someone did Insta. actually take the Chanel um, Instagram handle. They've got Chanel official. Someone yeah. else has Chanel that isn't Chanel, funnily enough. Yeah, exactly. So you, have, you need to always make sure you own that platform, but you don't need to put anything on it. And I'd also say, actually, um, you know, for, for a young designer, the beauty is, you know, as, as Henry mentioned, you have so much more flexibility to experiment with, with an established brand. Not only do you have you know, several people you have to go through to get sign off, even for every tweet of your certain brands in Paris, but you, know, you have this scenario where all, all I hear all the time is, well, who else is on there? I'll only launch on there if there's some other brands on there that are at my caliber. And if that's the case, well, that's not very you know, exciting or innovative or anything anyway. So I think the beauty for a young brand is to be able to go out there, have a play with it, and if it doesn't work, close it down. You know, some of the best ones we've seen, you know, even early days of Pinterest, things like that, just get on it and have a play with it. And actually, by being there early, that, you know, if you're lucky enough, it is a platform that takes off, that's great. I mean, obviously, there's a resource issue. You can't be on absolutely everything. But if you have capacity to experiment, then I would absolutely say to go for it. Daniela? Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it's also, it's the platform that makes more sense for you. Because, I mean, if you look at the age group of people using Facebook nowadays, it's slightly older than it was in the past. Then you have Instagram. The, just the social kind of, the social world is changing. And that I think is, is also, you should tr try to be an early adopter of new technologies because you never know what's going to be the next big thing. No one does. So if you wait for everyone to be on there, your opportunity to actually grow and have a big following on that one will be harder. So... I would say just adopt uh, and, you know, the technology that makes sense for your business, but just adopt the social and the technology that you feel comfortable with, but in an early stage. And, and there's definitely, um, I think with the young designers, the advantage that, uh, you know, like, like for Henry and his business, you know, they embody the brand and, and that's obviously the case in every single young designer. And that's what social media was made for as well, to tell stories about, about yourself, about your brand, whereas, with, with, the, with the big kind of, you know, multi-million, multi-billion dollar brands, um, you know, they're not using it in the right way. They're, they're posting pack shots of their latest products, and that is clearly not how social media was intended to get used. So, you know, I think, and the, and the well, not the consumer, but the, the, the audience knows that and will be much more likely to follow someone like, like Henry or, or younger designer where they are being, where they are learning something about that person, I think, rather than kind of, you know, following a Chanel that's going to kind of, you know, shove down, um, pack shots down their throat when they decide to post stuff. Now, um, 
I think somebody asked a question actually to the likes of the organization I, worked, what I work for, which is everybody on this particular panel is doing something difficult. They're not doing anything easy. And actually everybody yesterday was doing something difficult and everybody the day before in terms of Sunday was doing something even harder. And therefore the question that we have to ask ourselves within the industry, the supporters, the British Fashion Council is really around, well, how do we help and continue to support this fantastic activity? Because without these guys, then we wouldn't be here, obviously, having this fantastic conversation, but also um, we need to keep experimenting and keep doing more. So that's a question for us. Hopefully we can go away and think about that. I don't know if we're out of how, how much, oh, we've got one more question, okay? Just, no, uh, sorry, one more question here. Um, uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask what you, uh, what you all think, where you all think the social media culture is strongest, uh, or is it the same globally? Instagram. I spoke. Um, I meant uh, like part of the world, like U.S. versus Europe, or is it geographical more geographical question? Well, I went to Rio last summer to speak at um, Rio Moda Discute with the. I was on a panel with the editor in chief of Brazilian Glamour. One of the big PRs looks after Alexandra Herkovich, a couple of other people, Alexandra Farah from Brazilian Vogue. And social media is ginormous in Brazil. Instagram is the most, it's the biggest platform out there by far. And the whole country is obsessed with social media. I had no idea until I'd been there. And when I talked to um, Monica Salgado from Glamour, she said that social media is the biggest focus for um, Brazilian Glamour right now. It's as important as the magazine. I I would just expect I'm Brazilian. Daniela to I'm Brazilian, <laughs> so uh, it's exactly, it's, it's unbelievable. They, they adopt every single kind of new social platform. So um, I remember Orkut, I don't know if ever, yes. it was an American kind of, and then it was never as big as in America as it was in Brazil. Then Orkut, everyone was like, oh, we're abandoning, there's a new Facebook. Everyone moved to Facebook. And then the Instagram came, everyone moved to Instagram. They adopting, even for my app, Brazil is a massive market and the highest engagement and it's just, they just, they don't, I mean, in, in terms of technology, they are a bit behind, because not every brand has an e-commerce, but every single brand has a huge following, they're very active on social media, and that's what they do, but I think it's the, it's the culture, the country is social, so it's easy for them to be social on a daily basis as well as social platforms. Rachel, did you want to yeah, I'd second that as well, Brazil, 100%. Okay. And um, do we have time for one more quest question, or, yes? Um, building on the uh, instant accessibility and the fast fashion trend, do you think it's still relevant to have um, those types of events like Fashion Week every six months, or do you think we need a new fashion calendar? Probably, we probably need another panel to answer you that one. Any Who's sure. on the panel here? <laughs> I just um, asked Henry how many collections he was doing before we sat down to talk, and I don't. Burst into tears. <laughs> Does anybody want to answer that? Well, I mean, it's not a secret that, you know, it's the, it's the pre-fall um, and the, the resort collections that sell the most. And, you know, and oddly, we show, um, you know, fall, winter and, um, and spring, summer, the ones that sell, you know, less well. I think the events are 100% still relevant. I think maybe there's a question around seasonality, rather. Um, you know, and that's what we're, we're seeing a lot of people doing the, you know, shop the runway thing. Obviously, that's, that's hard for a luxury brand. There's obviously, you know, communications are sped up, it's super fast, but the, the process in terms of the manufacturing and the production, the operational side of the industry hasn't changed all that much. Um, so, you know, that's a bit of a battle, I think. That's why it's really interesting to see someone like Topshop have some of the looks from the runway available in the store on the same day. So for them, you know, the whole spring summer thing is kind of irrelevant. Um, you know, obviously it's, it's September, so. And it's not really about the fashion editors either. It's about selling yeah. straight to the consumer. In fact, even, even before um, this season, uh, a, f a couple of seasons ago, Topshop would make sure that what it put on its runway was relevant to what was in the store. So there was one season when there was a lot of crop tops before crop tops were obviously a massive trend. Topshop had crop tops in the store on the same day as the runway so that those consumers that were watching the live stream and then went onto the e comm site or indeed went into Oxford Circus or any other number of stores obviously could, could buy something that was pretty in line with what was on the runway. And that's why they have such a ginormous blogger front row. We always laugh, like, oh, look, we're in blogger row. And it's just a line of us all in the front row, and they're the only people who really seat bloggers to that degree because they're selling product. 
as a consumer, I completely agree with what we said. I, th I think the shows give you the, I mean, it inspires you, but you want to shop straight away. And that's the only, the, in my opinion, that's the only thing that needs to be fixed in the fashion industry. You can't wait six months to buy something after you see on a show. Or you either have an hour, or it's too late when it comes up. And that's pretty much, I have always problems shopping on a season because I've seen, you know, six months ago, and it's too old for me. It's already dated. So I think it's just the cycle of production should be shorter. And actually, just coming from a non-fashion non industry, shows like this provide a particular platform that I think are incredibly important. And so whether it's about the question of seasonality or things that need to change, I don't necessarily know. But the platform is incredibly important to people showcasing and to be able to sort of show their wares because it's incredibly difficult, as we've just identified, to do stuff online and solely online. You have to kind of marry it with other experiences that you actually have, and this is one of them. At least that's my thought on it. Um, is there, I don't know what time is. Time's, time looks like it's up, I'm sorry. Um, do cra catch us at the end, and I wanted to thank the panelists. Please do offer a round of applause to everyone. Thank you.